being acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In Naomi, my priest's room. She was. I read this story um, a couple weeks ago, and I thought, seriously? We read it at Bible study Tuesday morning, and one of the guys in the Bible study asked, have you ever preached on this? I said, no, but I will this Sunday. <laughs> interesting story we have here, is it not? It's even interesting if you read it in a different translation, because the words are different sometimes. And it's a, it's a story about Joseph, or part of Joseph's journey. And how many of you know who Joseph is? I, oh man, really? We need to start over at the beginning of Genesis and just read. Joseph is the great-grandson of, not Moses, Moses has not come yet, of Noah. And Joseph was the 10, 11th born son of Jacob. And Joseph is the father of one of the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And Joseph and Benjamin were Jacob's two most beloved sons, and Joseph even more, because Joseph had the what? All I know, most of you know this, you've seen the musical. The coat of many colors, right? So Joseph had this wonderful coat that none of his other brothers had, and that's why his brothers got upset with him and said, we got to do something about this punk because he's just taking all of Dad's love and he's getting everything that we want in the house, so we got to do something about it. So one day when they were out, they plotted a plan to, to get rid of him. So they, they dug a pit, they threw him in the pit, and then a couple of them came to their senses and said, wait a minute, we can't kill our brother. Right? So they sold him because there were some people coming. They sold him. And Joseph got sold to the Ishmaelites. And we read here this morning that Potiphar, who was a captain of the guard in, in Egypt and one of Pharaoh's captains, bought Joseph from the Ishmaelites. So Joseph was sold to the Ishmaelites and then taken down to Egypt and sold to Potiphar to be a slave in his household. Now see, Joseph's life is a lot like most of ours. It has its ups and it has its downs. Joseph was great in his house because his father loved him and he gave him this beautiful coat. And then he was down because he was thrown into the pit. And then he was brought up by the Ishmaelites and then he was taken down into Egypt. And then he was raised up into Potiphar's house. Why was he raised up in Potiphar's house? What does it say? Verse 2. It says this in here like five or six times. The Lord was with Joseph. And everything that Joseph did, the Lord prospered. So Joseph was raised up in Potiphar's house. And then he's accused wrongly, right? And did you hear the differences in the story there? The wife tells the story. And this is, if you don't think that the Bible doesn't mimic what's happening in real life, and that's really all I'm going to say about this. Because I'm not going to touch what's happening beyond the walls of this building this morning. But if you ever say that Scripture does not actually talk to us where we're at in our real lives, I don't think you really have read Scripture. Because there's a reason this story was brought up for the reading this morning, years and years ago when it happened. Right? So, Potiphar's wife looks on Joseph because he's handsome. He's good looking. And she thinks, well, why not? And she asks, tries to get him to lie with her. And he doesn't. And then, when they're alone in the house, she pulls off his tunic or his outer robe, and he goes running because he's not going to do that. Because what did he tell her before? He said, I'm, there's no one greater in this house than me and your husband. And the only thing he hasn't given me is you. Then that's because you're his wife, and that's something that I'm not supposed to do. So he's an honorable man. And she says to the servants after Joseph runs out, which is interesting because they were in the house alone, right? And then she called out to members of the household, and they came in. And she said, look, see, this, my husband brought the, among us a Hebrew to insult us, right? And then when the husband comes in, she tells the story again, and he says, she says, look, this Hebrew servant you brought in among us has come in here to insult me. 
story changes a little bit. But what's the most important part of this whole story that we're supposed to get? Joseph's life goes up and down. Things happen that are out of our control. Right? Can anyone say, yes, I agree with that? There are things that happen in our lives that are completely beyond our control. Joseph was sent to prison for something he didn't do. And how long did he stay in prison? We don't get that in our reading today, but it talks about it in the prayer that we pray. That Joseph was in prison for a while, right? You'll hear about it later if you actually continued on reading these stories. The story continues in the cupbearer and the baker are thrown into prison and both in, and are there with Joseph and Joseph interprets dreams for them just like he will interpret a dream for Pharaoh when the cupbearer gets released and is in the court of the Pharaoh two years later. So Joseph is in prison at least two years for a crime he didn't commit. And while he was in prison, what happened? The jailer saw him, the chief jailer saw him and knew that he was he was good and, and good to do things, so he put him in control of everything and didn't worry about anything that Joseph was in charge of. So Joseph's life was great. He had the coat of many colors. He's thrown into a pit. He's lifted up out of the pit by the Ishmael. He's taken down into the land of Egypt, which is interesting because what is Egypt? Egypt is this place in northern Africa, right, where Pharaoh lives. And they have a lot of monuments. And what are all these monuments to? What are the, the pharaohs? But not Pharaoh, the one that's living. They are to past pharaohs. They're to dead people. And the Israelites know that Egypt is the place that has this thing with worshiping the dead. So it's the land of the dead. So Joseph was not only sold into slavery and taken someplace, Joseph was sold into slavery and taken to the land of the dead where you would never come back from. But in that case, even in that place, the worst place that he could ever possibly be, he's raised up because God is with him. And and Potiphar sees that, puts him in charge of his house, and then he gets in trouble because he doesn't do it, do what somebody wants him to do, which he shouldn't be doing in the first place. And then he gets thrown into jail, and even in jail, when he gets thrown back down, he gets lifted back up because the chief jailer knows what's going on and how he can control everything. And then he's, he's released, and, and he goes on, and the story of Joseph is not just about Joseph. The story of Joseph is about you, because what finally and ultimately comes to play in Joseph's life? Joseph, after he interprets Pharaoh's dream, gets put into the court of Pharaoh and becomes the second highest person in all of Egypt, controlling everything. And he saves off a famine that's going to come and saves not only the Egyptians, but he saves his brothers that threw him in the pit in the first place. You see, because we can't control what happens in our lives. There's a lot of stuff that happens in our lives that's completely out of our control. And what can we do about that? That's not a trick question. What can you do about that? Things that are out of your control. You can cry about it. That's an option. I'm not saying it's a good one, but that's an option, right? You can accept it. Or you can know that God is always with you and going to help you through it no matter what. You see, Joseph didn't waddle or sink down into his pity. He lived his life the way that it happened to him. He accepted the things that came. Probably not happily. We don't really get to hear what's going on inside Joseph's head, which is probably a good thing. But he accepts what's happening and he moves forward in it because he knows that the Lord is with him. And, and notice in our readings and all of the story of Joseph, it's nothing that Joseph himself did. Except maybe interpret dreams or do the good job for other people that got him where he's going. But through it all, it says that Joseph was able to do this because the Lord was with him. And the things that Joseph did, the Lord made prosper. You see, it's not about what Joseph did or how good of a person Joseph was. Because some of you are probably sitting out there going, well, I have just as much faith as Joseph does, but my life's in the toilet right now. So what in the world's going on? Why isn't God with me? And that's the one thing that we don't see in all of the Joseph story. There's nothing that ever says, if God is with Joseph, why is all this bad stuff happening? 
You see, because the focus of the Joseph story is not to say, what is, if God is with us, why do we have bad stuff happening in our lives? It's not the focus of, of why bad things happen. The focus is of what is God going to do next? You see, Joseph has all of these things happening to him, all of these bad things, and in each and every one of these bad things that happens to him, God does something next. God does something where he takes a hold of Joseph and you think it's the last possible place that he could be and the lowest possible place he could be and God says, nope, we're not done yet. And he lifts him right back up. And that's what God will do with each and every one of us. How many of you know the song by Leonard Cohen called Hallelujah? That's it, seriously. You need to look it up. It's a great song. It's a wonderful song. From a very devout Jewish man, by the way, about life and how life is lived and how we have God by our sides through it all. I want to read you a quote that I've redacted um, about, from Leonard Cohen about his song, Hallelujah. He said, finally, there's no conflict between things. Finally, everything is reconciled, but not where we live. This world is full of conflicts and full of things that cannot be reconciled, but there are moments when we can transcend the dualistic system and reconcile and embrace the whole mess, and that's what I mean by hallelujah. That regardless of what the impossibility of the situation is, there's a moment when you open your mouth and you throw up your arms and you embrace the thing and you just say, hallelujah, blessed is the name. And you can't reconcile it in any other way except in that position of total surrender and total affirmation. That's what it's all about. It says that you're not going to be able to work this thing out. This realm does not admit to revolution. There's no solution to this mess. And the only moment that you can live here comfortably in these absolutely irreconcilable conflicts is in the moment when you embrace it all and you say, look, I don't understand a thing at all. Hallelujah. That's the only moment that we live here fully as human beings. When we understand that it's all completely out of our control, just as Joseph did, and live our lives knowing that God is with us regardless of the situations we walk in, because he promised he's never going to leave us or forsake us. It's just like the story of the cross, where it's the darkest moments of, of Jesus' day. But God says, wait a minute, I'm not done yet. And that's exactly what he'll say for each and every one of us. And when you can't understand it, just say hallelujah. Because God is always going.